just a moment, you'll see a recorder on the screen there. So I wanted to make that announcement and thank you all um, for joining today and for taking the poll. We are gonna leave this open for the next uh, couple of minutes here and just wanting to hear from you all in terms of who's in the virtual room that we're in today. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please, Rebecca. Excellent. So there are a lot of attendees on our call today and multiple speakers. So I'll be walking through the set of ground rules that you see on your screen. We ask that you abide by these ground rules whenever possible, just to ensure a really productive meeting today. So please use your computer to connect to WebEx. Uh, also, use please use the chat function to submit questions and comments and or to request to speak to the group. So either the chat function um, or the hand raise function as well. Uh, use your headset to take the call from a quiet space to reduce background noise and keep your phone or headset muted unless you are speaking to the group. Feel free to take a few moments to test out um, the chat function and the hand raise function as well. And we'll be monitoring chat, the chat function throughout the presentation and we'll be addressing clarifying questions as we're able. Uh, but we do have a formal Q&A at the end of the presentation and we'll address any additional questions at that time. And as I mentioned, please just take a moment uh, for those folks. We do have a few folks that are continuing to join to fill out the poll question. So we are able to see who we have in attendance today. We do have technology support if anything comes up throughout the course of our time this afternoon. So Brent Edgar is available and his phone number is on the screen here, 206-449-1172. And his email is brent at cascadiaconsulting.com. So if anything does come up tech related, uh, please feel free to connect with him and he will be able to help you troubleshoot that. And in just a moment, I'll also put his contact information in the chat function as well. All right, we can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and putting his contact information in there. So our agenda for the day, as I mentioned, we'll meet, we're meeting from 3.15 to 4.45 today. And during this meeting, we'll be providing an update on the schedule and what has happened since spring of 2020, which was the first public review draft and the comment period associated with that draft. We'll also be sharing an overview of the major changes that have been made both since 2016, as well as new changes since spring of 2020. And we'll be identifying next steps and opportunities for feedback. And please note that we are holding the Q&A session at the end of the meeting, but feel free at any time throughout the course of the various presentations to type your questions into chat as they arise. And we'll do our best to answer clarifying questions as they come up. My name is Gretchen Muller and I'm a senior associate at Cascadia Consulting Group and I've been providing communication support on this project along the way and also are, I'm serving as facilitator for the call today. I'm also joined by Sherelle Ehlers, who's the stormwater policy advisor at Seattle Public Utilities. She's also the SPU program manager for this project and is leading the stormwater code and volume one updates. She'll be presenting the key stormwater code updates today. She's joined by Matthew Bateman from SDCI, who's a member of the city's core team and has provided input on the submittal requirements as well as the de design criteria for both volumes one and three. And he'll be presenting an update on the master use permits as part of today's presentation. Our third speaker is Rebecca Dulapowski. She's an associate engineer at Herrera and she's the consultant team project manager and is also leading the volume three updates. So we'll be presenting the project background and status update, as well as the stormwater code manual updates today. And as I mentioned, we do have an active poll running. Um, so please, if you haven't had a moment to take that yet, uh, please take that to let us know who the, who's been able to join us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sherelle for opening remarks. Sherelle, it looks like you might be muted. Well, that's not helpful at all, is it? Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to attend today's meeting and uh, your interest in Seattle's stormwater code and manual update. 
Um, we've been really busy updating the documents, um, especially associated with equivalency with ecology. And it's been a really big team effort um, that involves Seattle Public Utilities, the Department of Construction Inspection, Department of Transportation Parks, and both uh, internal and external input, um, which we've tried to in incorporate. Um, we heard, we had our uh, uh, meeting in the spring and we heard um, comments and we tried to um, pull those in, but most of the comments we received were on volume three. So a lot of them won't, won't be addressed today just because we're not gonna talk about volume three today. But what um, some of the things that we are going to talk about uh, in the comments we received are regarding source control, some definitions, and clar clarifications related to closely related projects. Um, just as a reminder, these are proposed changes and we'll continue to rely on public input and ecology's approval, as well as council and mayoral approval. And this is our second review on the update and Rebecca will go over the timeline and other opportunities to provide input. And thanks again, really for being here and I really appreciate it. And I really wanna hear from you and um, get your feedback and input. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Sorrel. And with that, I'll be turning it over to Rebecca Dubopowski for the project update and background uh, status of the update. Great, thank you, Gretchen. Um, so I just closed out the poll, so that should be showing up on your screen. So it looks like we've got a good mix of folks in our virtual room today, a lot of engineers, about 40% uh, consulting engineers, a couple architects, a few contractors, developers, um, some city county engineers and planners, and other city county staff, and then a few folks that didn't answer. So thanks for answering that poll. So we kind of know the mix of people we have in the room today. Uh, we always like to start off with a little bit about why do we have a stormwater code and what's in our current stormwater code, some of the drivers behind the project and why we're updating the code and manual in the first place. Um, so the first part of this slide is looking at why, why is there a stormwater code um, and the main goals here are to protect life, property and surface waters from harm and also to meet the requirements of state and federal law. Um, so our big driver here is the update to the MPDES phase one permit. So that kind of drives the updating the code and manual. And so that requirement is through the Federal Clean Water Act and the MPS permit. Um, things that are included in the stormwater code include things such as source control for ongoing practices, construction site pollution prevention, and also requirements for on-site stormwater management, flow control, and water quality treatment. And so those are in the stormwater code and also in the stormwater manual. As I mentioned, one of our primary drivers is the phase one permit that came out, uh, was issued on July 1st, 2019 and became effective on August 1st, 2019. Uh, so the main drivers within that permit are what drives our schedule for updating the code and manual. And then also during that time, the stormwater management manual for Western Washington got updated as well. Um, so not only are we looking at equivalency with what's required by ecology through the MPDS permit, but also through the updated ecology manual as well and looking to make some changes for consistency with the manual. Um, in terms of public involvement, uh, we had a large team of internal and external stakeholders that we worked with. Um, so we had some initial workshops and meetings in summer or fall of 2019. Um, some of you may have attended our external outreach meeting last fall when we were still able to meet in person. So that was last fall in October 2019. Uh, we held a couple of public meetings earlier this year in April and May, and we had large turnout for both of those public meetings. Um, and so this is kind of following along with our updates. So this is our, our first of two public meetings for this next series. Um, as Sherelle mentioned, this first public meeting is focusing on the code, uh, volume one and a couple of the appendices. And then that January public meeting will be more focused on the full manual, which will include updates to volume three as well. Um, so here's just a quick overview of our timeline. Um, as you'll see here, we were working through um, options analysis and code manual revisions um, in the latter half of last year and early this year. Um, some of you reviewed the public review draft that came out in spring of 2020 and provided some comments on that. Um, next, we had a draft that we had to get to ecology for equivalency review, and we got that in uh, meeting the July 1st deadline. So that went into ecology and went through their review process. Um, we're mostly through that, still ironing out a few lingering issues, uh, but here we're in our second public review phase right in the middle of the slide here. Um, and as we mentioned, our focus here is the stormwater code, 
uh, volume one and submittal requirements, which are reflected both in Appendix B and Appendix I. Uh, we've got our third public review that'll be coming out in January 2021, and that'll include the code and the full stormwater manual, and then working through the legislative process next spring um, with the goal of the effective date to meet Ecology's timeline of July 1st, 2021. Um, next, I have a few slides that just kind of break down kind of the different phases or different things we're working on. As I mentioned, really the focus earlier this year was to meet ecology's equivalency items. And so the, the spring review draft really focused on that and we needed to get those items to ecology for review for equivalency with the permit. Um, so most of the updates there were made for equivalency and consistency with the 2019 SWIM and the phase one permit. Um, also added some things in terms of clarifications, uh, adding updating BMPs, figures, and tables. So along with that, we tried to address and clarify some other items that would help with implementation of the manual and the code. Um, in the latter half of this year and also into next year, uh, we're focusing on non-equivalency items and the SEPA process. So this addresses some of the items that are not related to equivalency, um, includes updating stormwater and combined sewer mainline extension requirements, updating combined sewer flow control standards and thresholds and updating sizing factors. And that piece is still in progress. I will be doing some technical editing and also working through the CEPA process. So as we're kind of closing out Ecology's review, we're shifting into some more of those non-equivalency items that'll be um, folded into the review draft coming out next year. And then to wrap things up, obviously we've got to work our way through the legislative process and adoption um, through the city council review and public hearing process. And then following that, we have kind of our implementation phase where we really focus on implementation tools to help support applicants and plan reviewers and also internal and external trainings related to the updated code and manual to make sure everyone's aware of what's been updated and what the new requirements are. Uh, this last slide I have here is just an orientation uh, before Sherelle gets into our slides in terms of what some of the key changes are in the stormwater code. Um, so you'll see this little blue lightning bolt will pop up on some of the slides and we put that in there to basically signify things that have been updated. Um, if you did review the spring 2020 draft, the lightning bolt means that's a new change that's been updated since spring of 2020. So if you want to kind of focus your review on those new pieces, um, take a look at those lightning bolts for what's changed since the first public review draft in the spring. And then also in green here, we've got the equivalency items noted. So there are some things that we had to change uh, for equivalency with ecology. And so we just noted that in green text that says equivalency. Um, so with that, I will, oh, I also wanted to highlight that uh, along with the uh, drafts that are out for review, there's also a summary of changes table for both the code and the manual. So you can take a look at that on SDCI's manual and code update page. And there's some, some great tables there that show what changed in the spring and what's changed in the fall. And so that'll help target your review as well. So with that, I'll pass things back to Gretchen. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And now I'll turn it over to Sherelle to present on the code updates. Great. And I remembered to unmute this time, so that's good. Uh, high level summary, uh, just uh, the changes include uh, exemptions for certain land disturbing activities, clarifications regarding uh, managing equivalent areas at an alternative location, new and updated definitions, uh, updated terminology and BMP references specifically related to construction, stormwater uh, pollution prevention and source control. Also more clarifications regarding closed, uh, closely related projects and construction of shared facilities and requirements for preliminary review. Slide. And, oh, I have to do my next slide though. My notes are on a different page, so, okay. Uh, other items include updates to the on-site uh, management list for all projects, uh, flow control revisions for parcel-based projects and roadway projects, revised flow control standards, and the allowance of uh, landscape management plans as an alternative to water quality uh, treatment. Uh, I did want to note one thing we said last time we were going to change um, was updating the precipitation time series to account for climate change but the timing hasn't worked out, um, especially it, since it got tied up with equivalency review with ecology. Um, so instead of changing the 158 year perturbed times and perturbing it for climes, uh, climate change, uh, that has going to, um, that's 
plan to be addressed in 2026 instead. So I just want to make that note. So, so to start off, uh, at the beginning of the stormwater code, we have uh, authority and exemptions. And uh, the first changes include exemptions, specifically uh, removing barriers to remediation and retrofit projects. In that for remediation only projects, um, removing the requirements for on-site stormwater management and flow control, uh, those are exempt. Those projects would be exempt from those requirements and only water quality treatment would be required if the project triggered the thresholds for treatment. And note that if there's any other development related to the project, then the, pro the project is not exempt from the on-site stormwater man management requirements or flow control. Uh, additionally, um, for stormwater retrofit projects, uh, either voluntary or ones that the city does, um, the whole purpose for doing retrofit projects is to either improve water quality, flow control, or flooding uh, issues. Um, so trying to demonstrate that they're equally protective to a specific flow control requirement or water quality um, requirement takes away from the the um, intended purpose of the retrofit project and pr provides a barrier to that. So those um, adding exemptions for those um, types of projects. And then also in the exemption section clarified that some activities may not be exempt from source control issues if the activities pose a hazard to public health um, safety or welfare. And this applies to both receiving waters and the combined system. And the uh, uh, section related to city agency pro projects, we updated the timing to accommodate for the timing of the 2021 stormwater code. And also in this, uh, in the authority section of the code, updated alternative compliance section, um, for equivalency with ecology, um, and it's related to managing equivalent areas either at an alternative lo location or by contributing funds. Um, what we have right now is still being reviewed um, by ecology, so it, that has not been approved as equivalent. So, and then we also clarify that based on the attributes of the site, additional requirements such as flow control may be required if a project poses a hazard if it didn't otherwise trigger flow control or, or uh, another minimum requirement. Similar to the city agency project um, for the transition section of the, the code to accommodate the 20, the, the timing of the 2021 stormwater code. Uh, and this is also an equivalency item, something we have to do based on our MS4 permit. So um, that is, um, that has been done. And we also clarified that what is considered a utility installation and start of construction. Moving on to definitions. Uh, we have four definitions that were added. And um, the first one is uh, added the definition of basic treatment receiving waters. And this was added to be consistent with volume one of the stormwater manual uh, regarding enhanced treatment. It was just a gap that was missing and just um, adding that to be consistent with volume one requirements already that are already there. Um, and then two new definitions were added uh, to be consistent with ecology's definition um, of gravel to asphalt equals new hard or replace impervious surface. And just uh, for consistency, uh, non-listed creeks was added um, since listed creeks is in the definition, but non-listed creeks was not. So it's not a substantive change. It's just it's cleaning up some stuff. Uh, there was quite a few definitions that were changed. Um, there was a name change for the construction stormwater control plan. Creeks were updated to match the um, state creek typing system. Um, it was um, the state has updated that. So um so we just wanted to be consistent with how the typing goes for creeks um and then for development there were changes to be consistent with ecology's definition including clarifications to add subdivision subdivisions and short plats are considered development and then noting that development is a type of project uh change that effective impervious was the change uh, to effective hard surface master use permit um it, it had its own 
uh, definition, but now it just refers to the land use code. Uh, regarding pollution generating impervious surfaces, change it, we made changes to be consistent with ecology's requirements, including adding rail lines and railways, um, as in light rail, that are considered pollution generating. Uh, updates to the definition of project to be consistent with ecology and project site as well. Um, and made a slight clarification in the replaced surfaces definition about um, down to foundation. Uh, there were two changes to single family res residential project definition. And uh, one is adding that associated detached accessory dwelling units are considered part of the single family project. And another part, uh, the other part is changing the threshold for um, new and replaced on single family from 10,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet. So if you have over 5,000 square feet for a single family project, you are will become a parcel based project. Um, and then the definition change for changes to be consistent with ecology. Uh, section 22802 prohibit and permissible discharges. There was no edits to that section. Um, the section 22803 mineral requirements for all discharges and all real properties. Um, there's a new BMP added for rooftop dog runs. And under the section for all businesses and public entities added uh, that there's new BMP requirements for source control when it's associated with fueling uh, specifically dedicated stations, mobile and in and over water and maintenance and repair of vehicles and equipment and concrete and asphalt mixing production and pouring. And the, these requirements uh, BMPs would apply to receiving waters and the combined system. So in section for mineral requirements for all projects, uh, language was added for closely related projects. Uh, when master use permits uh, requiring are requiring preliminary drainage control review and the timing of construction of stormwater facilities that will serve multiple proposed lots, parcels, or tracks. Uh, for single family and parcel based uh, parcel based projects, updated terminology, um, including changing reduced to altered when applying uh, on site stormwater management. And for parcel and roadway project added fresh uh, flow control thresholds for converting vegetation or increasing runoff during a hundred year recurrence interval flow frequency. And that was just um, to be equivalent with ecology's requirements. And another um, substantive, another change that we made because of equivalency, uh, equivalency is uh, clarifying requirements for protecting wetlands. So to be more transparent with projects that trigger the requirements to extend a public drainage system, uh, we had the extension requirement um, moved to the mineral requirements for all project sections of the codes, as opposed to only having it in the requirement located under authority. And that way all the mineral requirements for projects is all in one place. Um, and when we talk about projects, that's usually development and land disturbing activities. And the language clarifies that extensions are required for large projects. Um, and by definition, that means greater than 5,000 square feet of new or replaced hard surface and uh, that do not have a piped public drain system abutting the public place or other hazards, other projects that, that pose hazards. Um, additional clarification related to conveyance requirements in the right of way, um, such as curb discharge, uh, inlet requirements um, will be addressed in a new director's rule, and that will be available in January for review. I I mentioned I already mentioned this. Um, I just wanted to bring it to the project section and out of the definition section. Um, it just that so that's noted in in that order. Um, and again, the single family projects. Uh, the ADUs attached or detached ADUs, I should say. Um, ex well, accessory dwelling units in general are part of the um, SFR project, but the revision um, for the threshold for single family projects uh, was 10,000 and it's uh, now 5,000 new plus replaced hard surface. 
For parcel projects, who uh, revise the flow control threshold for new plus replace hard surfaces, uh, specifically um, the thresholds changed um, for creek and small lake basins, and the threshold is going from uh, 2,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet, and the combined is um, going from 10,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet. And I think you'll see a theme here. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, as an overview, this uh, this table shows the changes in thresholds in bold on the right hand side. Um, and look at the thresholds overall and the complexity of the code. One of the goals was simplifying the code requirements. Um, and to do that um, was to lead uh, to uh, led to uh, the threat most of the thresholds being at 5,000 square feet, a new uh, plus replaced uh, hard surface with a few exceptions. Um, so just going through um, on-site stormwater and management thresholds for parcel based and single family is not changing. It's still 750 square feet or 1500, same as the 2016 code. Um, and for the combined basins analysis was completed by the combined sewer team and determined that a smaller threshold for projects in the combined should be implemented to mitigate, uh, to help mitigate the impacts of development. <laughs> 2016 threshold for combined is 10,000 and the pros proposed is 5,000. And both creeks and small lake uh, basins, uh, the threshold is proposed to increase from 2,000 to 5,000. And especially in creek basins, this acknowledges the inefficiency that is associated um, with meeting the pasture standard because the minimum or size of a half in an inch. Um, is um, too big in some sense, in a sense, to meet the pasture standard. So it's it's looking at the inefficiencies that are associated with um, that orifice size and meeting the standard. Uh, for capacity constraint systems, this is one that you know, the, was not changed. It's still at two thousand square feet, um, um, unless the project can down, demonstrate that the downstream system has the sufficient capacity. And for the ditch and culvert system, that means demonstrating a capacity analysis for peak flows for the 25 year recurrence interval. And again, uh, the engineer of record is still required at 5,000 square feet as well as for other scenarios, but um, the main threshold usually that is triggered is the 5,000 square foot. Um, and when there's a no um, point of discharge and also a new requirement has been added that if in a um, uh, if your project needs a hydraulic project approval permit, an engineer of record is also required. And finally, as noted below, before single family projects greater than five thousand square feet are now are are a parcel based project. For parcel based projects. Um, the discharges to small lakes, the flow control standard was revised from a peak control standard to an existing condition standard, and which means matching the existing durations of the existing site uh, condition for half of the two year flow up to the 50 year flow. Um, and I noted this before, but I'll say it again uh, for capacity constraint systems, flow control is not required if you can do a downstream and it. Um, uh, uh, analysis and show that this downstream system has uh, can has capacity for the 25 year storm event. And that is like usually a quarter mile downstream um, is that you, what you have to evaluate. There we go. For roadway projects, um, the flow control thresholds are based on new hard surfaces and not and and not new plus replaced hard surfaces. And when flow control is triggered in the roadway, um, the threshold, um, the, the, they'll have to comply with existing condition standards for discharges to listed non-listed creek and small lake basins. Because the city is investing millions of dollars in constructing large storage facilities to reduce combined sewer impacts, the flow control requirements for roadway projects is proposed to be removed. Most often, um, 
let's see, most often these detention systems are in the right of way, are installed in the middle of arterials and making the long term maintenance dangerous and and often they does not result in the right infrastructure in the right place for mitigating right of way impacts. Next slide. Um, so I'm not going to go through all these different changes, but uh, on this slide, but I will on the next two slides, but um, we have made changes to all the on, on site stormwater uh, management list. So, if you could go to the next slide, um, so this for this, these changes apply for single family and parcel based projects and generally, uh, or we'll use parcel based projects as a uh, example of the changes. So, the 1st change to highlight is that infiltration is number 1 that infiltration trenches and drywalls can be used for non roof surfaces, but is not required. Right now, the 2016 code says that you have to use them for non roof hard surfaces, which is almost uh, impossible when you have a sidewalk project and trying to collect and convey it to a drywall doesn't work. Um, but if you want to do it, you can do it. Um, for number two, we added a new category, um, BM, category two BMP. Uh, it's a sidewalk and trail compost amended strip. And this applies um, to all the on-site lists, but it does needs it need ecology's approval. Um, and so that's on the same level as permeable pavement or infiltrating buyer retention. Uh, the third item to highlight is that um, a lot non infiltrating bioretention vegetative roofs and rain, rainwater harvesting um, option was moved to uh, category four. Um, and that shifted the former category four BMTBs to category five. And um, we also added that water quality number four the water quality um, treatment BMPs can be used in lieu of non infiltrating bioretention. For services that discharge a designated receiving water waters, and this applies to parcel based projects because a uh, single family doesn't trigger treatment. And uh, the rate regarding rainwater harvesting item number 5 that you can see there's 2, um, it's listed to, rainwater harvesting is listed twice on the. Um, on the list approach, and if it, it's still an option in category 2. If it's sized to meet the on site stormwater performance um, standard, but it's not required. So, um, and then added in category four, an option to do rainwater harvesting that has to be evaluated. But uh, if you get down to a category four level, but is sized um, at a 25% volume reduction based on feedback from designers, um, that could be. Uh, Realistically met, and then just minor. Uh, the six is we uh, newly planted was removed to acknowledge that both new and retained trees count towards the on site list because our our existing trees are very valuable. So the for trail and sidewalk projects and roadway projects uh, again, uh, as I mentioned before. There's an addition of the sidewalk trail compost amended strip, and it still needs ecology approval. And then also, and the, this is new for both those lists, uh, trees and evaluating of trees was added to both of those lists as a category four BMP. Uh, a big equivalency change that we had to do were um, requirements uh, to update the um, wetland protection standards um, and the requirements are based on various wetland characteristics that are determined by a wetland biologist through a wetland report. And that includes determining class and type of wetland, the habitat and habitat score and the presence of breeding amphibians. And looking at that, um, you would determine uh, whether or not you do have to do a method 1 flow control or a method 2 flow control and typically method 1 flow control applies to class 1 or 2 wetland 
and it is depression on riverine and the owner has legal access to to the wetland um and it requires one year of monitoring of water level fluctuation and water holding capacity if if those don't apply and you trigger flow control requirements um then method two would apply instead and that's the same um requirement that is existing in the stormwater manual a code now method one is a new um added um requirement for those higher level um wetlands that ecology made us uh, required that we uh, include in the code so for flow control as i noted um we there is a existing condition was added and it mainly applies to small lake basins and roadway projects additionally um, the peak standard control standard which uh typically apply which applies in the combined basin or capacity constrained basin was updated to reflect the downstream impacts of a project and to optimize the control based on smaller storm events and so the new peak control standard has uh, three uh, benchmarks, I guess you would call them, um, for the two, five, and 25 year um, storm events. And um, I'll ha I have a couple of slides to show what the um, changes are, but if you use only infiltrating facilities or rainwater harvesting or both, then you can meet the pasture standard instead. Um, but I'll go through with these tables. Um, what the sizing difference is and it's um so what does the change mean um for the peak control standard well it depends on the bmp used and in some cases the amount of contributing area so it's really complicated so i have three examples um one's infiltrating bioretention and two are um, detention vaults of different sizes. So this first one is the infiltrating bioretention. And if you've been using the precise tables for projects uh, less than 10,000, they're um, uh, the size is a bit larger. And for this example, and using infiltrating bioretention on a project with 4,000 square feet of new plus replaced hard surface, the change is approximately 20% larger. Or said another way, um, the 2016 sizing would be 832 square feet, which you can see in the bottom. Um, and uh, the sizing for 2021 is 992 square feet. But uh, if you're doing modeling, uh, oops, I went too far in my notes. Just If you're doing modeling, um, the change is more dramatic and it's for two different reasons. In modeling, you most likely are using the default parameters for, but for small sites, the de default parameters are not um, appropriate. For example, the length of the overland flow default parameter in MGS flood is 500 feet, which for many sites in Seattle isn't realistic. So in updating the stormwater manual, there will be either required parameters or site specific parameters um for when you're modeling uh so in using the correct uh hspf parameters the sizing changes quite a bit so you can see going um for the um, 2016 standard the default parameters which probably most people were using to the um, 2016 the same peak standard it um jumps quite a bit um just using the correct hspf parameters and then going from there up to the proposed peak control, the 2021 peak control standard, um, the change is not as dramatic. Um, and a lot of it comes from just using the correct um, HSPF parameters. Um, and this is partly when the precise um, uh, tables were done, they, the HSPF parameters were adjusted, so that's why there's not such a big change in that. But then in modeling, we um, there was no direction on the HSPF requirements. So on the next example is um, a detention vault sized at 5,000 square feet. 
or sorry, sorry, uh, for 4,000 square feet of effective impervious area. And um, the and then the next one will be for, it's well, 5,000 square foot parcel, and the next one will be for a 10,000 square foot parcel. And um, just a second, I can't read my notes because they're too big. Um, so for the 5,000 square foot uh, parcel scenario, using the pre-sized uh, tables, the increase with the 2021 peak standard is approximately 15% for this example that we're showing here. Um, and the 4,000 square feet of new and replaced, it was 171 square feet for 2016, and now it's 196 square feet for that example. But if you've been, again, if you're modeling the same thing that happened in the previous slide also happens here, um, that the default parameters uh, aren't realistic for the site and using realistic parameters, and this is a small site, so your parcel is probably 50 by 100. So a 500 foot um, uh, flow path is not, is doesn't make any sense. So, um, and that changes the sizing quite a bit. And then, then going from the 2016 standard to the 2021, it's a similar 15% sizing increase. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Um, oh, now this one is weird though. <laughs> the modeling, the modeling sizing is the same. Like I don't, I'm not going to repeat it because it basically is. You know, the default parameters makes it get way bigger. But in the pre-size change, there's a little bit of nuance um, uh, associated with that. Uh, and when the pre-size tables were developed uh, in approximately 20 for the 2019 or 2009 code, well, um, the orifice was held at a half inch diameter to simplify implementation. But in doing that, the vault or the tank wasn't optimized. So um, for the 2021, for the pre-size tables, we plan on optimizing the orifice. For So for like this example, I think this 10,000 square foot parcel, um, the orifice, if you put a one inch orifice in, then you actually can build a smaller tank than what you were doing before. Uh, and so that's why I said it's confusing, but it, it goes up some places, it goes down in other ways. But in all in all, when you use the appropriate HSPF parameters, the sizing change is not that much. Okay, oh, get, it, get through those things. <laughs> um, so moving away from flow control and into water quality, we, uh, I think this is a little more straightforward. Uh, for equivalency, the enhanced treatment requirements for parcel-based projects uh, was updated to include projects that construct four or more dwelling units if the threshold for water quality is triggered. And this is, for like I said, for equivalency, we had to add that in. And then also for uh, pollution generating surfaces, I mentioned this previously, that um, we've added the option to have a landscape management plan as an alternative to water quality treatment, um, but this is still under review with ecology. Next. Oops. Yeah, I've got to change my page. Okay. And for drainage control review and application requirements, Matthew will get um, into this uh, a little bit more about the specific requirements. But we, the in that section, uh, preliminary drainage review was added, and there are also updates to the thresh thresholds uh, for standard drainage review, and also, there's a requirement for drainage review for certain activities or projects, such as fueling stations, mobile fueling stations, um, that um, that also would require a standard drainage review, even if the threshold is below 750 square feet of new and replaced or land new and replaced or land disturbing activity. I can't off the top of my head remember what that number is. Um, and then. Also, I mentioned this, but uh, in this section, there's a requirement for an engineer of record when a hydraulic project appro approval is required. Um, and with uh, the last section, 22808 stormwater code enforcement, 
Uh, we don't have any edits there, so that recovers uh, that covers the review of the stormwater code changes. So I will pass, pass it back. Pass the ball or the floor. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sherelle. And with that, I will turn it over to Rebecca and Matthew um, on the key stormwater manual changes. So you'll be hearing first from Rebecca, who will start with the key changes in volume one. All right. Thank you, Gretchen. And thanks, Sherelle, for walking us through the changes in the code. So I wanted to start off, uh, as we mentioned, that this is kind of a focused review for the manual for this fall 2020 draft. So it's focusing on volume one. Um, appendix B, which is a new appendix that used to be related to volume two and some construction stormwater requirements, but we've kind of repurposed that for our additional submittal requirements. So Matthew will be covering that. And then appendix I, kind of the new piece there is the landscape management plans, and we'll be covering that at the end as well. Um, a couple of things to note here is that uh, we didn't post the updated volume one figures yet with this draft, but those will be posted in January along with the full manual. And also the code language callout boxes don't read the code in those callout boxes. It's kind of grayed out and there's a watermark on it, but take a look at the separate code file for the, the code update. And then during the final draft, we'll go ahead and make sure all that language is consistent with the final code. Um, so if you're interested in the code language, don't look at the boxes in volume one, look at the separate code document for those. All right, this is kind of my overview slide for volume one and kind of some of the key changes. Um, you'll notice that there's a new acknowledgement section at the beginning of the manual um, that's still a little bit in flux, but at least there's a good placeholder there for that. So um, those of you that submitted comments on the spring draft, you'll notice that you're called out there. So thank you for those, those comments and they definitely help with the updates to the manual. Um, we also, some of these are from the spring draft as well, but clarifying definitions and providing examples for different types of projects. Um, we expanded some of the text related to special circumstances projects that proposed to develop multiple blocks, discharge to closed contour basins, or discharge to multiple drainage basins. Um, we consolidated some of the requirements for land disturbing activities, so some of those things that Sherelle mentioned for utility projects, pavement maintenance projects, remediation, and drainage control. Those are kind of all put together in that section. And then Sherelle also mentioned the approved landscape management plan, so that's also mentioned in Volume 1. Um, added a reference to Ecology's BMP, the T540 for preserving native vegetation. And then we also added basic treatment receiving waters back in, which was in the 2016 manual. We pulled it out in the spring, now it's back in. So no change from 2016, but you'll notice if you reviewed the spring that that had was um, strike out text and now it's, it's back in the manual. So no change there from 2016. Um, some of the key changes in chapter two. So this is determining minimum requirements. Um, a lot of these are similar to what you looked at back in the spring. If you took a look at that, that draft of the manual, um, adding criteria for closely related projects, a lot of updating clarification of project types. Um, so some things that have changed here, we added some additional examples for parcel based projects. So you'll see here this little lightning bolt here. Um, there's now some examples there listing apartments, cottage housing development, townhouse development, commercial use development, et cetera. So there's a, a full list of different types of things that would be considered a parcel based project. Um, also clarify that non roadway projects in the right of way are considered parcel based projects. Um, added some activities that trigger drainage review for source control. Um, a new add in the fall draft is that if you have a project that doesn't require a, a PAR, um, you can contact SDCI or SPU via email, and there's the email addresses provided there. Um, so that'll help you confirm your project discharge location if you don't have that uh, PAR as part of your project. Um, in Chapter 4, a lot of these are similar to what you looked at back in the spring if you reviewed that draft. Um, so there's examples here for adding the de minimis allowance for when groundwater discharge triggers the peak flow control standard. Um, there's added or revised uh, reduced requirements for certain land disturbing activities. So that's kind of tied into that previous section that I just mentioned. Um, you may notice here that the terminology still needs to be updated in section 5 point or 4.5.4, um, but that's looking, it said structural stormwater control projects previously, and now it's drainage control facility retrofit projects. And there's also some project examples included there. Um, also in chapter four, we added an updated text for special circumstances in section 4.7. Um, as I mentioned before, that includes projects that develop multiple blocks or discharge to closed contour basins. Um, those require compliance with both peak control standard and pre-developed forested or pasture standard when both apply. 
In Chapter 5, um, we updated and clarified that if non-infiltrating BMPs or BMPs not included in the on-site list are used, then the area required to be managed with flow control may not be reduced. Um, as we mentioned on that overview slide, we added that approved landscape management plan as an option for treating runoff from your pollution generating pervious surfaces. And we added the concept of basic treatment receiving waters back in that was from the 2016 manual language. Um, chapter seven had a few changes as well. This is the site assessment and planning section. Um, we added some text here related to assessing impacts and risks to wetlands. Uh, so kind of mirroring some of ecology's requirements for what's needed in terms of a submittal um, and when looking at wetland requirements. So you can find that in section 7.4. A new section here on landscaping principles in section 7.8. Um, this we noticed when we were doing the review for the, what was required for the landscape management plan and what was in King County's surface water design manual. Um, we noticed as we were reading through that, that a lot of the principles mentioned there were more general landscaping principles that would really apply to all projects, not just projects that had a landscape management plan. So we decided to fold that into this site assessment and planning section. So that's a new section 7.8. Uh, if you're familiar with King County's manual, a lot of that's fairly similar. There are some tweaks uh, related to city specific requirements, but a lot of that text is the same as what King County has. And then in adding that new section 7.8, we shifted the site design considerations forward. So that's now section 7.9. So that really hasn't changed much. It just got shifted forward. So I think that's my last slide. I'm going to hand things over to Matthew to walk us through chapter eight of volume one, and then also kind of provide an overview of appendix B and appendix I. Okay, so um, chapter eight in volume one is about the drainage control review and application requirements. And so as Sherelle mentioned earlier in the code, one of the big changes is adding up the preliminary drainage review. So this is to clarify the submittal requirements for MUPS, for master use permits. Um, and I'll discuss that a little bit more in a second. Um, we also um, made a few changes to the standard drainage review section. Um, specifically, we added some items required on drainage control plans. <clears throat> so these are the uphill run-on areas, source control BMPs, identification of the standards that each BMP meets, and then clarifications of for the existing and proposed grades that are shown on the plans and to clarify that we want retaining walls to be shown in the plan since it affects drainage. <clears throat> We've also clarified some of the drainage report requirements and um, also that in appendix B we've included a new section that has the um, recommended drainage um, report format and content requirements. And also in the section, we've added a couple things to the list of additional documents that may be required during review. And these include the upstream analysis and closed contour analysis. Next slide. So Appendix B, <clears throat> like Rebecca mentioned, um, this was a chemical treatment section, but now we're just <clears throat> referring to the ecology manual in volume two for construction stormwater for that. So we've changed it to um, the first section. It gives some additional information about um, submittal requirements for um, preliminary drainage review for specific MUPs, um, so including subdivisions and short plats, unit lot subdivisions, and lot boundary adjustments. Um, we also talk about the in, in subdivisions and short plats that um, construction of shared drainage, drainage facility um, has uh, new requirements. <clears throat> So also in Appendix B is this drainage report format and content requirements. So it mimics the steps in Volume 1 for determining the min minimum requirements. It also describes some other typical figures and things that should be in the drainage report. Next slide. Um, so getting more into the preliminary drainage review. So the main purpose of this is to provide clarification and consistency of MUP drainage review and the requirements for short plats. Um, previously in our, well, in our current code, it just says that MUPs require drainage review, but um, not all MUPs really necessitate drainage review. A MUP can be anything, it's, it's, a, it's just a master use permit that SDCI issues. So it could be anything from a subdivision to a mass, major institutional master plan to it could be a, a signage approval. Um, so we've, um, made some clarifications to hopefully that 
get it, get the whole the process written down and um, make everybody understand what's going on. But <clears throat> so in general, um, preliminary drainage control review, you'll submit a preliminary drainage plan and a preliminary drainage report. And there's instances where that's not needed, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we, we're clarifying which MUPs actually get drainage review. And then we're establishing requirements for shared drainage facilities and subdivisions and short plats. Next slide. So the MUPs that will always get drainage review for preliminary drainage review are subdivisions, short plats, lot boundary adjustments, and unit lot subdivisions. And um, so you, you should plan on submitting preliminary drainage control plans, unless for subdivisions, if flow control and water quality wouldn't, won't be triggered from the development, or and there's um, available stormwater infrastructure, and the plats, um, if needed, is conditioned to require the main, any mainline extensions, then we can defer it to the building permits. But otherwise, if flow control or water quality or um, some sort of major infrastructure is required, we're going to need preliminary drainage control plans and report. Um, lot boundary adjustments are a unique one because they are existing lots. And so the, we will still have drainage review, but the only time you need, actually need drainage plans is if there's no available stormwater infrastructure and you need to demonstrate infiltration um, or dispersion to for um, a project that doesn't have anywhere to connect to. Um, and that's because of a land use requirement that adjusted lots have adequate drainage. And unit lot subdivisions are unique too because usually the the plans have already been submitted with a building permit that's in review or approved. Uh, if that's not the case, then you'd have the same process as a subdivision or short plat with the preliminary drainage report and, and plan. Next slide. So there's a, um, any any other maps. There's other maps that may require preliminary drainage review, and this is at the discretion of you know the directors or reviewers. So it's any map that allows development including 750 square feet or more of new and replaced hard surface or 5,000 square feet of land disturbing activity and where the directors determine that it's it's required and considering but not limited to the following attributes. So location within an environmentally critical area, ECA or buffer or proximity and tributary to an ECA or buffer. And this is mostly to, to catch um, projects that have their, the ECAs have non-disturbance areas, so, so such as steep slopes, riparian corridors, or wetland areas, where um, you may be blocked off from accessing um, stormwater facilities. And so we want to catch that in the MUP review rather than find out in the building permit that you've got that problem. And also, um, Proximity and tributary to an area with adequacy, erosion, water control, quality, or flooding problems. So, if there's if there's downstream um, problems that, that we know about, I want to make sure that's looked at with the the MUP. Um, otherwise, other MUPs typically won't be sent for drainage review. Next slide. And the other um, big thing that we've changed is. Um, we, we've done, done this before as a condition to subdivisions and short plats, but we've put this in the code and describe it in, in Appendix B. Um, so if there's shared drainage facilities that serve multiple lots in this, the subdivision, so they'll have to be permitted and constructed for subdivisions either prior to recording and, the, and prior to the final plat approval, or they'll, it'll need to be bonded prior to recording and then constructed prior to issuance of any other building permit in the subdivision. And for short plats, since there's not a preliminary and final process, you just go straight to plat approval. Um, the facilities would have to be built prior to issuance of any other building permit in the short plat. And this is to make sure you don't get a whole lot, bunch of houses that are um, permitted and in construction, and then you find out that the, the large detention vault that serves all of them has, hasn't been constructed. Next slide. So moving on to Appendix I with the Landscape Management Plan and Integrated Pest Management Plans. 
This section was previously just the integrated pest management plan section. And we've added the landscape management plan requirements. And like Sherelle mentioned, this is in case you want to submit a plan that you can use in lieu of um, providing water quality treatment for pollution generating pervious areas. So this is like landscaping lawn that's considered pollution generating whenever you trigger that, which is triggered at three quarters an acre of, of new and replaced um, pollution generating pervious area. So you can do this landscape management plan. It does have to be approved by the city. Um, and the requirements are laid out here in the appendix. And we're, we're still going back and forth with ecology with us to iron it out. And, but we've based ours on the King County, um, King County's manual with some modifications. Um, also, there was a few minor changes to the integrated pest management plan section, mostly to to um, coordinate the terminology that's on the city's integrated pest management pl um, plan website. And we've added a reference to that website in, in the appendix for additional resources. And I think that's all I got. I'll pass it back. Excellent. Thank you so much, Matthew. And I'll be providing a quick snapshot of next steps, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Excellent. Thanks, Rebecca. So we're currently, as this timeline shows, we're currently in the second public review phase for the draft 2021 stormwater code and manual. The fall 2020 uh, public review draft comment period runs from November 2nd through the 20th, so next Friday. So all public comments are due by next Friday, November 20th. And the web link uh, is both in the chat. Uh, Matthew put it in the chat earlier during our call today, and it's also up on the screen, and it takes you to SDCI's webpage where the documents are posted. If you do have formal comments that you'd like to share, please use the comments spreadsheet on SDCI's webpage and email the completed spreadsheet to the email address that you see up here, which is SPU Stormwater Code REV at seattle.gov. And today's meeting materials, mainly the summary of the changes tables, they're already posted to the website. The PowerPoint, as well as the meeting recorded recording of this meeting will be posted to the project website after this meeting as well. So if there are folks within your networks and communities that weren't able to attend the meeting today, uh, please feel free to direct them to the SDCI webpage where all of these documents, as well as the meeting PowerPoint will be posted. And there will be another round of public review, um, which will include the full code, the manual, and the appendices in February of 2021, which will be the next opportunity for your input. The winter 2021 public review draft comment period runs from January 11th, 2021 through February 19th of 2021. And the next public meeting is scheduled for January 28th. The legislative process will occur in the spring of 2021 with the new code taking effect by July of 2021. And this concludes the formal portion of our meeting today, and we'll now be moving into the Q&A portion of our meeting. And just a reminder, we'll be fielding questions two ways. Uh, so feel free to put your question, comment in the chat. We'll be monitoring chat uh, until 4.45, which is our close of the meeting, and also the hand raise function. So if you'd like to share verbally or in a written format, uh, both are available. And with that, we will open it up to questions. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Michael, uh, Shelter Homes. Um, thank you guys for that presentation. I was just a little curious about uh, the requirement on short flats and long subdivisions um, about building out drainage infrastructure prior to building permits being issued. Um, that, that's typically uh, really inefficient and outside of kind of the normal construction process. Uh, I was curious to know, do you guys have any uh, provisions for bonding uh, in lieu of doing those things? And Sorry, sorry, there. <laughs> Matthew, do you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, so we have the provisions for <clears throat> for full subdivisions because um, that's already in the land use code. Um, but we don't have we we don't have anything built in for the for short plats. Um, 
Is there an ability to add that? I mean, that's that's pretty important uh, distinction there. To, it, it really slows things down, uh, and it really is going to impact a lot of people. Yeah, if you could, that's a good comment. Could, if you don't mind, like sending that as a, co uh, as a formal comment, comment. Yeah, that, sure, that would be great. Um, now, keep in mind, it's not all drainage facilities. It's only like the major shared facilities that we would be requiring that. Um, and okay. So, like, if a water quality treatment was required for all of them, um, so they could be, and, and the building permit could be in in and under review. So, um, if if we had a three lot short plat with a detention pipe and a pump on it, you guys are going to want to see that installed and certified before you'll issue the three building permits. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's that's a challenge. Now, now, okay. Now, if you had a three lot short plat that each lot had its own detention it's a little yeah that'd be that, different. then then it would become they, then each is operating by itself but in the right. preliminary plan you could you need to show that that's possible to meet the the flow control standards doing it that way but that works great for us and we don't need to worry about conditioning and holding up any sure. building permits sure. but yeah, send, okay. us, send us some more comments about that Okay, uh, thank you. And then I was also curious um, on the unit lot subdivision drainage review. Um, th there are weird instances where there was like old townhouses that somebody's coming back to subdivide. It would make sense to me that you have a drainage review then. But 99% of these things uh, typically, you know, have a fresh drainage review associated with the building permit. Um, are, are you going to make us jump through a bunch more hoops uh, on the unit lot subdivision side? No, uh, it's some the unit lot. It's probably going to be very similar to what you're used to. Um, and actually, most of the MUP review is very similar to what you're used to. It just was never described in the in the in the manual in the code. But yeah, if if you already have if you already have your dream review done and your building permit ahead of your unit lot subdivision, you don't need to do anything different. Just no no extra plans, no preliminary. We don't need to go backwards for preliminary plans. Okay, so we didn't in care of. The engineers are not putting together a new plan set and they're not duplicating a plan set with a new project number or anything like that no not awesome. in that case okay. yeah the only for subdivision chart plats is just because of the planning that needs to happen early on um, to it. show that the, the full standards could be met but okay cool thank you guys uh -huh. and then we have a comment in the chat what units were the pre-sized flow control graphs in cubic feet uh Sorry. The pre These are square feet. Square feet. Sorry, I should have put a um I should have put a, a legend down there. Those are square feet. And it's because the pre size are either three foot tall or four foot tall. Um so there's some parameters and it's it it's I can't remember. I think it's a three foot tall vault and um those are square feet uh, with a three foot tall. So, thanks, Shira. Just a quick orientation. If you're having trouble finding the hand raise function, if you hover over your name, it should pop up as an option. We have another question in the chat here from Bill. Why are athletic fields considered pollution generating surfaces? This seems excessive and leads to a lot of additional time and cost. Both grass and synthetic fields infiltrate the vast majority of rainfall. That is a requirement of ecology. And it's something we are thinking about talking to them about, especially for the athletic fields that are switching over to um, uh, non-petro types of um, uh, rubber that they're moving towards, uh, help me, um, cork, 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 thank you. I'm like, what is it? So yeah, so that's something we wanna to talk to ecology about, but it's, it's specifically required by ecology um, in their permit. So, yes, I hear your concerns. Thanks, Sherelle. And he added additional uh, crumb rubber to cork infill, but you also yeah. that as well. Great. Great. All right, so we've got another question in here from Bailey Cook. For projects that are currently in design, how will vesting work when we switch to the new code in July of 2021? Um, if, if you're already in and you have a complete application, then you will be vested under the um, existing code as long as you construct 
within the time period, which is, I think, 2026, I think. So um, it's a, I, I think that's the time period. So if you're under a review right now, you should be fine. Um, and you'll still be vested to your 2016. You don't have to start over when the new code comes out if you have a complete application and submitted. And that's a complete application for the building permit. Um, so like if you had a, a MUP for a building, uh, the MUP doesn't vest you um, if there's a separate building permit. So if, if you're in MUP right now and your building permit won't come in until after the, the date, you'll be need to be under the, the the 2021 code. And I think you said we need to be constructed by the time the code takes effect. Do we mean we need the building code needs to, or we need to vest to the building code standards? And the building okay. application needs to be submitted and accepted prior to code adoption? Um, well, let me just look at it. Do you no, you don't need to be, Yeah. you wouldn't need to be constructed. Just yeah. vested standard vesting. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. But if you if you want to use the 2016 code, um, you have to have it constructed by this is the city agency process. Can you scroll down just a little bit? Um, Rebecca? Yeah, is yeah, it is the this, next page or is it this one a, here? It's a little bit further down. Um, keep going. That's city agency. Keep going. Uh keep going. Um, keep going. Sorry, I tried to find the right section. Oh, no, it's all right. It's okay. You're good. So here it's um the 20. So you'll, if you want to, it's B, if you want to, if you're using the 2016 code, you have to construct it by 2026. So, um, and if you want to stay under the 2016 code, so, um, yeah. Great. Thank you. And then we have a couple of additional questions in the chat. One from Lori. King County allows for underdrained athletic fields to be modeled as 50-50. Would City of Seattle consider this? Matthew, you've talked about the modeling. I can't remember what you what was what it is though. Can you follow up on that? Yeah, we've we've considered it. Um, and in the past, we've decided not to allow that. Because, but we do allow um, it to be modeled as an infiltration facility, if if possible. If you can demonstrate infiltration and you can show ponding, um, and so we hadn't considered that for this this revision. Anything what you, about fifty what, fifty? What's fifty fifty? What what does that mean? Oh, like fifty percent grass, fifty percent impervious. Okay, just okay. kind of a, a straight. So yeah. we you are not allowing that, but we would allow right. modeling, like yeah. if you can dem demonstrate infiltration. <laughs> and you can raise <laughs> and you raise your under drain up so that you do get infiltration. So you can't have the under drain at the bottom. Um, right. right now. Yep. So you actually so. get pond, some, a little bit of ponding to allow the infiltration to happen. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. We have another question from Bailey Cook. For phased building permits, would that be the phase one that drainage is normally reviewed under? Matthew, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, so it, it usually is a phase one that, that um, of a phase building permit that, where we do drainage review. I, I like to think of it as any phase that includes any permanent new and replaced hard surface. That's a phase where the full drainage review needs to happen. But if there's special circumstances, um, come talk to us and talk to the, um, we have permit specialists that are, that that work on the stage, the phasing, so we can work out special circumstances. Um, that was just in relation to the, the vesting. Sorry, I got kind of split up from it, but I was just, you were saying the application needed to be in for the perm, the building permit, and it was just wondering if it's a phase, would that just be the phase one the application portion is submitted? Um, yes, yeah, the phase one. Okay. Uh, that, that would vest you in, in, a, in a phase yeah. permit, right. Okay. Okay, awesome. Now, it's a, it's a better question if you're thinking about if you have a separated shoring and excavation, um, that we may need to look into that deeper to understand how that would work. But I, I assume we would vest it the same as, as well, since the, the project as a whole has started. Thanks, Matthew. We have a question from 
Thanks, Bailey. We have a question from Jennifer. If you have a remediation only project that will be submitted before the new code is in place, is there any mechanism to get the exemptions being applied for ecology with the 2016 code? Um, I don't know. I guess we'll have to talk about that. I don't, I have to talk to SDCI and, and that. I don't know how we do that. Some more, and that brings up a good point to you that we'll follow up. If there are questions that um, need additional discussion, then we'll follow up with responses um, and get those circulated. Sounds like this one might fall under that category, Sherelle. Uh, yes. Okay. We have a question from Lily. Yes, a more expedited phasing review would be nice since drainage is under phase one below grade um, superstructure, but a lot of BMPs, for example, vegetated roofs and rainwater harvesting is typically designed in later phases. Example there above grade. Okay, so comment versus a question. Um, thanks so much, Lily. Anything you wanted to respond to that comment, Sherelle or Matthew? Uh. Yeah, we've we've heard that a, a lot, um, and it it is kind of tough to get everything. Um, if 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 really needed, um, you know, we can you can do a, a complete concept drainage drainage plan and and report that refers to the later phases that will for for other sections. So you've kind of demonstrated in phase one that overall you're going to meet the requirements. <clears throat> it is. It is kind of hard to I understand. It's hard to coordinate with the final touches in the first phase, but um, those things should be considered early on in the project and not uh, as afterthoughts. So it's kind of a push and pull with that. Great, thank you, Matthew. Any other questions or comments you'd like to share? As part of our Q and A right now. I'm scrolling to see if there are any hand raises. I don't see any. Pause for a moment. Okay, not seeing any hand raises and not seeing any new comments or questions in chat. I'll pause for another couple of moments here. <laughs> yeah, and I, I appreciate everybody's time. And yeah, if, please make comments. Um, we want this to be the best product it can be. So, um, yeah. and and yeah. especially like in the appendix B and the and also I with the landscape management plan. So those are brand new sections, and <clears throat> they're intended just to, um, especially the, the appendix B with the MUPS. It, um, Try to answer a lot of questions that people have. So, if if you re review it and you still have questions, please yeah, please comment so we know what what needs to be ironed out, or if you have concerns, that would be great. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. We really appreciate your time and participation, all of your great questions and comments as well. And thank you so much for being part of our call today. You'll see on the screen here both Sherelle and Matthew's contact information, so don't hesitate to contact either of them if anything comes up after this meeting that you'd like to share and also visit the SDCI website and the project page uh, for submitting any formal comments that you would like to submit by next Friday, the 20th of November. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.